The transcription reads, He who owns this diamond will own the world, but will also know all its misfortunes. Only God, or a woman, can wear it with impunity. Hamid, 1839. Hello and welcome to Visions of the Past. My name is Andrew, and I'm the host of this Assassin's Creed lore podcast. This is episode 49, and today we're talking about the Peace of Eden, known as the Koh-i-Noor. The Koh-i-Noor in Assassin's Creed dates back to Juno, who used it to destroy the people who murdered her father. But I'm a history buff, so before we get into that, I want to talk about the real history of the diamond. The Koh-i-Noor is a historic diamond whose name means Mountain of Light in Persian. It's believed to have been mined from the Kalor mine in India sometime during the Kakatiya dynasty. The diamond was placed into the peacock throne of the Mughal Empire by its fifth emperor, Shah Jahan. In 1739, Nadir Shah invaded Delhi and took the stone out of the throne along with the Timur ruby, choosing to wear them in an armband when he left Delhi with the rest of his looted treasure. The diamond stayed in Nadir's family until 1813, when Ranjit Singh took the gem from the Shah Shuji Durrani, a descendant of Nadir, during his exile in the Punjab. Ranjit's plan for the diamond was to give it to a sect of Hindu priests after his death. When he died in 1839, the British media exploded into outrage and urged the British East India Company, who, at the time, had a large presence in India, to keep track of the Kui Noor, so it could eventually end up in their hands. After Ranjit's death, though, the Punjabi throne went through a bloody period that saw four different rulers over four years. By 1843, Dulip Singh was on the throne at the age of five, and he wore the diamond on his arm. After the Second Anglo-Sikh War in 1849, and after the Sikh Empire was annexed by the British East India Company, Dulip signed an amendment to the Treaty of Lahore that required him to give away his sovereignty and the Koh-i-Noor diamond. The Koh-i-Noor was formally presented to Queen Victoria on July 3, 1850 at Buckingham Palace by the deputy chairman of the British East India Company and presented to the public at the Great Exhibition in Hyde Park in 1851. Based on the reception of the diamond, Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband, had the Koh-i-Noor Recut and polished, reducing the weight from 38.2 grams to its current 21.12 grams. The diamond was then mounted in a honeysuckle brooch and circlet that Queen Victoria wore, as it was part of her personal collection. She wore it often, but eventually became uneasy about how it was acquired, admitting in a letter to her eldest daughter in the 1870s that she was opposed to the taking of India and that she disliked wearing the Koh-i-Noor. After the Queen's death, the Koh-i-Noor was set in the crown of Queen Alexandria that was used at the coronation of her and her husband, Edward VII, in 1902. It was transferred to Queen Mary's crown in 1911, and its final transference was to the Queen Mother's crown in 1932. Currently, all of these crowns are on display at the Jewel House at the Tower of London, with crystal replicas of the diamond set in the older crowns. The Natural History Museum in London also has replicas of the diamond in its pre- and post-cut forms, so you can see the comparison of the two different sizes. Now, the Kui Noor in Assassin's Creed has a much different history. Within the storyline, the diamond is a piece of Eden, and was first seen within the comic Assassin's Creed Brahmin, and we saw it again in the comics Assassin's Creed Templars and Assassin's Creed Uprising. While it was mentioned in Assassin's Creed Rogue and Assassin's Creed Syndicate, it wasn't until Assassin's Creed Chronicles India that it appeared fully within a game. The powers of this piece of Eden are the ability to project physical holograms, expel blasts of energy, locate other pieces of Eden, project shields, and to even rebuild itself. The known history of the Koh-i-Noor within Assassin's Creed dates all the way back to the human Isu War when it belonged to Juno. The day her father Saturn was killed by his human servants, Juno went into a rage and used the piece of Eden to destroy all the servants around her and her father with blasts from the artifact. After the extinction of the Isu, there is very little known about the Koh-i-Noor. Found first in 1739 by Nadir Shah when he attacked the Taj Mahal, Nadir named the artifact the Koh-i-Noor and, in 1749, 
when he was attacked by a group of assassins led by Salah Bey. The artifact ended up in the hands of the Afghan chief Ahmed Shah and was not seen again until it ended up in the possession of the Ottoman Sultan Selim III, who had the artifact in 1805 when Napoleon sent Jan van der Graaff to steal it from the Sultan. On his way to Libya, Jan met Solomon Bolden, the Black Cross of the Templar Order at the time, who was searching for his predecessor, Travis Oler. After the pair traveled to Tripoli and met with Jan's contacts, Edmund and Akbar, who taught them how to get into the Sultan's palace, Jan and Solomon bonded over drinks, with Solomon trying to learn what the diamond was that Edmund had mentioned. When the pair made it through the tunnel leading into the palace, they were ambushed by several men waiting for them. During the brawl, Akbar showed up and stabbed Solomon in the back, revealing himself to be an agent for the Sultan, and threw Jan in the palace's dungeon. While in the dungeon, Jan met another prisoner, who turned out to be Travis Olaire. Over the next three years, Olaire trained and eventually inducted Jan into the Templar Order. On July 29, 1808, Euler overheard that the assassins were coming to buy the koh i and staged a breakout with Jan. Euler sacrificed himself in the attempt so Jan could finish the mission. When Jan reached the Sultan's apartments, he found that Akbar was actually an assassin and had poisoned Selim and was already in the possession of the koh i intending to betray the assassins and keep the artifact for himself. Akbar tried to use the koh i but Jan saw through the illusions and killed Akbar. After Akbar's death, Jan told the rest of the assassins that she had no interest in the Templar assassin war, leading to him being spared and the assassins leaving with the koh i box. Unknown to them, though, Jan lied to them and removed the artifact from the box before the assassins left. The koh i wasn't seen again until 1839, when the assassin Arbaz Mir stole it from Maharaja Ranjit Singh's summer palace, where it had sat since 1830. Found in a pool of water within the hands of a statue of the Isu Durga, who is identified as the principal Hindu goddess of war, strength, and protection. Arbaz hid the artifact under the turban of his companion, Raza Sora. This came in handy, as when they returned to above ground, they were met by men of the Maharajas. During the conflict, Raza escaped, and Arbaz ended up arrested, while the men took a replica of the artifact. Eventually, the Maharaja's granddaughter, Payara Kur, freed Arbaz, revealing that Raza had given Payara the koh i Payara then told Arbaz that the Maharaja was drinking tea with the British, causing Arbaz and Raza to head to the Imperial Palace. Once making it to the palace, Arbaz slapped the teacup from the hand of the Maharaja, believing it to be poisoned, and then turned on the Templar, Francis Cotton. Cotton stated that it was too late to save the Maharaja, causing the Maharaja himself to draw his sword and to call Cotton a coward and a deceiver. Cotton took the opportunity to call the guards, stating that the Maharaja was under attack by Arbaz. While Arbaz dealt with the guards, Payara spoke with her dying grandfather. The Maharaja told Payara to flee India and hide the artifact that she admitted to having in her possession and to keep it safe from the Templars. Grabbing a robe to hide herself, she attempted to escape the palace, but she was attacked by Cotton, trying to get the koh i Raza dug his fingernails into Cotton's forehead, and when Cotton turned on Raza, Payara activated the koh i taking the appearance of the Isu Durga, who, at one point, imprinted her consciousness on the artifact. Durga used Payara to convey a message, referring to humanity as splintered, but that the race was guided through messages left by the Isu. Cotton, who was horrified at Durga's appearance, fired multiple shots, one of which struck the koh i shattering the artifact, severing the connection between Durga and Payara. This also released an energy wave that when all was said and done, the only people left alive was Abaz Mir, Kayara Kur, and Ranza Sora. After the artifact reconstructed itself, Arbaz left the Peace of Eden in the hands of the Indian Brotherhood's mentor, Hamid. Hamid wouldn't hold it long, though, as he was captured by Templars William Sleeman and Alexander Burns in 1841. These two Templars sought to use the koh i to power a precursor box in hopes to unlock the diamond's secrets. After Arbaz saved Hamid and learned what the Templars were planning, Hamid charged him with stealing both Isu artifacts. 
Arbaz recovered the artifacts in the Katas Raj temple, causing Sleeman to lay siege to the Maharaja's summer palace in Amristar and take Payara Kor hostage. Arbaz, romantically involved with Payara, headed to save her. During Arbaz's attempt to save Payara, William Sleeman proposed a trade. Give him the artifacts, and Payara would live. In response, Payara stabbed Sleeman, and while he fled with the box, Arbaz managed to get a hold of the koh After the fight, Arbaz gave the artifact to Ethan Fry to hide. Ethan hid the koh somewhere in India, and a replica of the artifact was confiscated by the British East India Company in 1850, where it became part of the British Crown Jewels in 1877, when Queen Victoria was proclaimed Empress of India. The Kuinoir itself wasn't seen again until 1928, when Rufus Grovesvener tried to blackmail Albert Bolden after Bolden failed to report to his superiors in the Templar Order after a mission in 1927. Bolden refused and headed to Switzerland to retrieve it from a bank lockbox that he had the artifact hidden in. Bolden held onto the artifact over the next nine years to hide it from Grausvener. Sometime in 1937, Bolden returned home to find that his family had been murdered and the Coup Noir was gone. Bolden hunted Grausvener over the next few months, ending up in Spain, where he found that Grausvener was attempting to manipulate Spanish assassin Ignacio Cardona to unlock the artifact's power using his high concentration of Isu DNA. Cardona was almost consumed by the powers of the Koh Noir and passed out. Bolden chose this point to attack, sustaining several bullet wounds, but he was able to escape with the unconscious Cardona, though Grausvener escaped as well. After Cardona woke, Bolden revealed himself to be the Templar's Black Cross, which led Cardona, himself an assassin, to attack him. Bolden easily subdued Cardona and gave him a briefing on what had happened to him and how his friend Norbert Clark was actually Rufus Grausvener and what his plan was with the Cui Noir. Bolden then asked Cardona to help him track down Grausvener in exchange for Bolden to help him warn his assassin cell. Cardona agreed and the two hunted Grausvener to a church. When confronted, Grausvener convinced Cardona to use the Cui Noir. It ended up backfiring on Gravesner, though, as Cardona unleashed the artifact's energy to cause the church to collapse on them, and then used it to create another illusion to make it appear destroyed, when it was really intact and buried beneath the ruins of the church. The Peace of Eden sat in the ruins until 2018, where Juhani Otzo Berg hunted the artifact by living through the lives of Jan Vandergraaf and Albert Bolden, until he took the role of the Black Cross and tracked moles within the Templar Order. Berg then helped a cell of assassins to finish his hunt for the artifact. When they found the location of the Peace of Eden, they had to rush to get a hold of it before the Instruments of the First Will, a group dedicated to the Isu Juno. The two groups got to the church in Spain almost at the exact time, and a fight broke out. Even after Charlotte de la Cruz activated the artifact, Ajaz Dipdami, a former assassin, ended up leaving the battlefield with the Cui Noir, to take it to Alvaro Gramatica's hidden lab in Australia. The Cui Noir was then presumably used to help Gramatica create a body for Juno. In August of 2018, Berg and Charlotte's cell of assassins showed up at the lab with the intention to finish Juno off and recover the multiple artifacts within Gramatica's lab. During the battle at the lab, Charlotte attempted to assassinate Juno, but failed to be saved by the sage Elijah with the Cui Noir. Eliza and Charlotte used the artifact together to protect the assassins, and eventually to trick Juno into a conversation with a coffee cup, with Juno believing that it was Kansas. Juno did eventually realize that she was being duped, asking Eliza for the coup noir, a request that Eliza responded with by allowing Charlotte to stab her through the neck from behind. The lab started to fall apart after Juno's death, resulting in Berg destroying the building in an attempt to destroy all traces of Isu DNA held within the lab. This not only destroyed Juno's body, but also appeared to see the end of Charlotte. But Elijah was able to use the explosion to escape with the Cui Noir. The Cui Noir diamond is one of those items in human history that lends itself perfectly to being a piece of Eden. Said to be cursed because of the history around the diamond dealing with a great deal of bloodshed between men, it grew to have a reputation in the British royal family to bring bad luck to any man who wore it.
leading to only being worn by female members of the family after arriving in the United Kingdom. Within the series, though, we really only see its power shown off within the comics. The essential guide even goes so far as to say that it's rumored to be so powerful that it could unite all other pieces of Eden. To me, though, that seems like it's a little too powerful, making whomever has it one of the most powerful people in the world. One thing that can lessen that is that the comics go to great lengths to show the artifacts to have adverse effects to men who try to wield it, such as Ignacio Cardona bleeding from the eyes and then passing out when he used it. While the powers of the Koei Noir seem more suited to a comic than a video game of the series, it's interesting to think of the artifact being in the hands of a 15-year-old sage who also happens to be the son of Desmond Miles. The story potential is near endless with that combination. The Koei Noir in Assassin's Creed, even with its immense power and downsides, is a great example of what I love about the series. Showing secret history of historical artifacts and the history around them, going so far as to say that the item we think is actually the Koei Noir is an elaborate fake ever since it was in the hands of the British royal family. Thank you for joining me today. Be sure to tune in every Tuesday for new episodes. If you love the Visions of the Past podcast, I'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give a review on Apple Podcasts. If you have any questions about Assassin's Creed or topics that you'd like me to cover, please feel free to hit me up on Twitter and Instagram at visions underscore AC. You can find those links in this episode's show notes. Until next time, my assassin friends, make sure to follow the creed. And to those Templars listening, may the Father of Understanding guide you.